Around the year 1275, a Dominican friar in Italy named uh, Cecilus created the most popular book in Europe. It was um, known as Ludus Cachorum, written originally in Latin, and it spread throughout Europe. It was the second most copied book in Europe, next only to the Bible. Um, copied, I say, because it was actually written by hand. However, about 200 years later, 1474, in Bruges, Belgium, also known as Brugge, the second book ever printed in the English language was that book, the, an English translation, of course. It was uh, printed using two French versions as a source of the material, and it came to be known as The Game and Play of the Chess. Now here is a photograph of a reproduction of the original. Uh, you'll notice that it says the game of the chess. The title was a little bit in flux, but it didn't matter because it was the only book ever it was the only book ever printed about chess in the English language, so you're not going to confuse what it is. Okay. Uh, the first book printed in the English language, by the way, was some obscure history of Troy. So um, really, this was the this this book was the first major book printed in English, and a few years later, it was the first book ever printed with um, block prints, as um, you know, existing among the uh, text. Now, let's just get on with this. I want to show you what I got. Here's a little uh, list somebody put together of the letters that are used in the, their type. They actually borrowed the type from the German press because German books were being printed first, so you know they had to use the letters that were available when they started printing um, letters in English. So they had all these things. This is A, this is the way B appears, this is the way C appears, sometimes connected with other letters, D appears. It was a pretty different literary culture, but it was surprisingly modern when you actually read the words. Um, this is an interesting uh, illustration. The opening illustration is a fellow chopping his father's body up into 300 pieces. Well, you know, this is some medieval stuff. There was a lot of grizzle in those days. And uh, it was in your face, unlike the modern day of uh, grizzle being far away and removed. Okay, let's read this a little bit, okay? Among all of the evil conditions and signs that may be in a man, the first and the greatest is when he feareth not, nay, dreadeth to displease and displease, and make wroth God by sin, and the people by lying disordinately. And it goes on to explain that this man of very bad character. Um, assassinated his critics and he his father of course was a big one I mean what father wouldn't be so he chopped his father up into 300 pieces and fed him to as many vultures oh, um, very nicely illustrated if you can say that and then it goes on to opine that a fellow named Xerxes in Babylon um, was the inventor of chess and you know every society has an inventor of chess and it all had always had much more to do with who the society attributed you know novelty and invention to more than you know historic evidence because you know historic evidence is kind of a modern concept so anyway here's Xerxes the inventor of chess more information about how he used chess to bring uh, moral teachings to that really terrible man whose name, by the way, was Evil Merodach. Terrible guy, but he, he got better with chess. Um, okay, let's go on to uh, 1883. So we're jumping up about 400 years, and the book was reprinted with an extensive um, introduction. The introduction, I think, is about this far in. Yeah, you can kind of tell that the pages. Look at that old books, huh? The pages are actually a little bit different from the introduction than the ones that are part of the the book. 
And uh, here's that section again with a modern type, but still the old, old uh, original spellings. By the way, spellings were not uniform at all. They would spell the same word uh, two or three different ways in the same paragraph. You know, they didn't care. Some people say that they actually took pride in it. I, I don't know if that's true. Among all the evil conditions and signs, blah, blah, as we just read, when he recteth not, ne'er taketh heed unto them that reprieve him and his vices, but slayeth them. In such wise did the emperor Nero, which did do slay his master Seneca. And it goes on like that. So, um, this book, you know, probably costs about upwards of $200 to buy, you know, from a collector. You know, it's kind of special. But basically, it's that same thing. Now, nowadays, you can get it in a nice sleek paperback from Amazon and it's saying the same thing among all the evil conditions and signs blah 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 uh, strangely enough I did detect some uh, spelling discrepancies among some of these but you know who knows what the originals were I guess you gotta go to a museum and check out the original and find out it doesn't really matter um, very interesting but we can go back even further to um, the original, more, more, more original, by Jacob de Cecilis. And this is a modern English translation because, you know, things have changed a bit. So, you know, for comparison, let's look at that same section, okay? It's, it's got the, the plates, you know, even though these plates didn't arise until later when the book was published in London. Somebody put the, um, you know, the woodblocks in. But here's English, modern English. Under which king the game was invented. Of all things that destroy humanity, the worst is a person who scorns God, offends other individuals, shuns self-improvement, and assassinates his critics. You know, it was true then, and it's true now. Some things about morality just stick. And that's what this book is about. It's not about chess so much per se. It's about how chess is a metaphor for all the moral rightness of a functioning society. And, um, you know, the medieval society had it down in that regard. They knew how people were supposed to be, how each person was supposed to maintain their station, and that was the friar's job here, was to explain to everybody. For instance, the king was supposed to be righteous, you know, merciful, you know, clear, you know, basically you have good character and not supposed to exploit others and take advantage of his station and power. And, uh, you know, that's normal, that's true for leaders everywhere and always. The queen, now this is um, a bit dated. The queen was, well here, the queen should be pure and chaste and thereby a mirror and model for other women. You know, when they say chaste, they don't mean she's a virgin, they mean she is sexually appropriate. And, you know, that that's often an issue with uh, leaders, right? But for the queen, as a woman, it was her job. It was like the definition of her job. In fact, there's a, it goes on through little stories telling about, you know, exactly what they mean. Here's this, here's, here's how it ends. It tells of a woman who, uh, she had a, she was a duchess, she had a certain land, and a king came by and, you know, well, wanted to maybe conquer her land. She said, hey, no problem, just marry me, you can have my land, and he said, okay. But that was a very immodest proposition for a woman to make. And this king, oh, he was a Hungarian, and apparently the Hungarians were often called the avaricious. And they Basically, he married her, um, threw her to his men to have them all rape her, and then they murdered her in the most vulgar and horrific way you can imagine just to make the, demonstrate that they disapproved of a woman being, you know, sexually forward. So, I like to think things, things have changed. Now, here's something interesting. The judges, now, the bishop in chess 
it hasn't been a bishop that often. I mean, now it's established as a bishop, at least in our language. But even in other languages, it can be the fool or the elephant or different things. So understand that we call it a bishop, but it makes sense that here they were calling it something else. For them, it was they were elders or judges. And they had to be fair and not take bribes and all that stuff. Now, there's even a story in here about a judge who behaved inappropriately and so in anger the king ordered that his judge be skinned alive and his skin stretched over the judge's chair. Then the judge's son was appointed in his father's place so that when he sat on the chair he would remember what had happened to his father. Now that is so medieval and vulgar and just a few years after this was, um, let me put that down, just a few years after after this was printed in which one? Printed in uh, Brucha. Someone there made an illustration of that, you know, and here's all the towns, or, you know, the officials standing around and making sure that this goes appropriately, and here's, he's taking it pretty well, and they're basically cutting the skin off of his body, and the little time lapse here shows you in the corner that his son is sitting on the chair with this big skin hanging over it. Um, that's how uh, people reminded each other of proper behavior in those days. So anyway, this tale is attributed to Persia. And there's the picture of it. And you can still see that picture in Bruges if you go and visit. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, the rooks were deputies. There are no castles on the board. And often throughout the history of chess, rooks have been um, something like deputies or um, remote commanders, which makes sense because they have a lot of power, but they don't start out right next to the king. They go on to different parts of the board. So anyway, the rooks were deputies. Now, something about the medieval logic is that they'll take an existing order, like, okay, the rules of chess, and ascribe to it moral character. So, um, let's see, what do they say about this? The king cannot be everywhere in his kingdom at once, so it is necessary for him to have deputies who enforce his power and announce to the public whatever he himself would proclaim. Uh, uh, well, that's not a perfect example, but... Um, Maybe I can find some more. Okay, the commoners are the pawns. Now, for Cecilus, every single pawn had an identity. You know, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, essentially. And everyone actually got a picture. It's really interesting to note how much attention was given to the common people in this. Here's who's, Which one's this guy? Concerning the second pawn. So every pawn gets a chapter. And it says he must be loyal and take care of important matters. This is a, a goldsmith and so on. And then, and then it explains as, as they go on talking about the moves of the pieces, um, why it is important that each piece moves next to some other piece because the queen has a certain relationship to the merchant and so on and so forth. Anyway, very a very nice window into the medieval mind and uh, the underpinnings of morality in our day. So, uh, this, by the way, was translated from a German version, which they say was very close to the original uh, Latin. Although, one, you know, one would have to do more research to find out what's the most original of originals. And when they recopy them, they add updates, things that are more relevant to their society and chess as they know it. So the whole study of ancient literature is very interesting. Very interesting. So here we go. 1275 about. Um, printed again in uh, 1474. The first, or the second, uh, I should say, book ever printed in the English language, printed in Bruges a few years later. Block prints added, the first ever English book with text and block prints. Republished in uh, 1883 in England. 
with the block prints and available in both forms with the old English and with the modern translation. This is ancientchess.com and thanks for your interest in chess, where it's been and where it's going.